Today we'll be talking about the deity and personality of the Holy Spirit. The deity and personality of the Holy Spirit. This is a study from pneumatology. Pneumatology is the study of the Holy Spirit. Pneuma meaning spirit. Ology is obviously referring to study. When we come to the deity and personality of the Holy Spirit, it's first important to establish that the Holy Spirit is not just simply an energy force. Now, that's a big mistake that uh, Armstrong's followers and Jehovah's Witnesses are teaching, and that is heresy. That is completely incorrect. We do not believe that the Holy Spirit is just simply limited as a force. There's no way. Now, it is true that the Holy Spirit, he has energy, he has force, so to speak, but he's not just a substance or a neuter it. Now, there are several arguments used by the cults to prove that the Holy Spirit is limited to a neuter it, because more, simply, more simple than you think, it is in neuter form when you look at Greek. The Holy Spirit is attributed the pronoun of neuter, not masculine and not feminine, but neuter. However, that's a very weak argument. It shows how much more they do not know Greek. Whenever Jehovah's Witnesses use Greek on you, just laugh. And the reason why is the more they try to use Greek on you, the less they know about Greek. I mean, there are several examples. Like, they'll talk about Sheol and Hades and other stuff in the Greek. I mean, their translation of John 1 is super sloppy in Greek when they talk about in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. But they say was a God. Uh, their translation and understanding of Greek is very sloppy. In this case, it is definitely sloppy because just because a Greek neuter pronoun is used for the Holy Spirit does not mean the Holy Spirit is neuter because you can find many examples in the Bible where neuter is attributed to people. For example, ch child in Greek is in neuter form. It's in technon. So that's one example, child. Another easy example is if you live in the Bay Area, you do know that feminine pronouns can be attributed to things. That don't make it a woman, all right? Now, I know that this is like your girlfriend to some of you. And you call it, you know, Alexa and my girl, and she said this. And for some of you guys who aren't married, you know, you need to get a life and stop doing that, okay? Stop doing that, like this is my girlfriend, stuff like that. I know we live in that kind of a world, but you're wrong, all right? It is not a she. All right? It's not a woman. <laughs> Masculine pronouns can be attributed to neuter objects as well. So there's your simple answer is not just Greek, but other different languages. Spanish is very common here in California. And you do know that feminine and masculine pronouns can be attributed to objects. And you do know for example, in the Greek language, neuter pronouns can be attributed to people. So that's a simple argument against the Greek rendition of spirit in neuter form. Now we're going to talk about evidences and proofs that the Holy Spirit is a person and is God himself. What I would like to start out is to prove the deity of the Holy Spirit, the deity of the Holy Spirit. Now, you can find several videos on that from our channel, so you'll find them easily. But let's go over the deity of the Holy Spirit since that is our discussion today. First of all, uh, go to John chapter 4. John chapter 4. I would like to happily say as well, you can find this in the Jehovah's Witness Bible, the New World Translation. So, if the Jehovah's Witnesses have a New World Translation, pull up these specific verses. And these specific verses will prove that the Holy Spirit is God. 
Actually, believe it or not, from what I research, but I could be wrong, is that there are more proof texts in the Jehovah's Witness Bible proving that the Holy Spirit is Jehovah God more than Jesus is Jehovah God. <laughs> That's amazing. So let's start out with John chapter 4, and we'll look at verse 24. So that's the first proof text, is John chapter 4, verse 24. We believe that God, Jehovah, is a trinity. He's not limited to one person. The trinity has three persons, and that's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We're going to see how the Holy Spirit, through five strong proof texts, that he is Jehovah God himself. So John chapter 4, verse 24, very self-explanatory. God is a what? Spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Jehovah God, his very own being, is spiritual. Is spirit. Spirit. So uh, think about it. When the Bible says Holy Spirit, do you think that's just an energy neuter force? Or referring to God's very own being, His own person, the Holy Spirit. Another one is 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. All of these can be found in the Jehovah Witness Bible. As a matter of fact, I would even dare say that the Jehovah's Witnesses in their own Bible will say Jehovah is the Spirit. That plainly, not just the Spirit being God. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. All right. Oh, excuse me. Uh, that was a wrong passage. Um, it's uh, second, uh, 1 Corinthians. Uh, oh, my goodness. I had it written down, but I didn't. I'll look that up later, okay? So I apologize for that. I'll look that up later. But the other one is go to Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5. Notice that Simon Peter, when he was speaking to Ananias and Sapphira, he said that they were lying to the Holy Spirit, but then later on he said that they were lying to God. So we see right here that the Holy Spirit is God. Acts chapter 5 and verse 3. Verse 3. But Peter said, Ananias, <coughs> why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? Right? But notice in verse 4, whilst it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto who? That's very serious there. So the Holy Spirit is God himself. All right, 2 Corinthians 3. I apologize. 2 Corinthians 3, not 1 Corinthians 3. You'll notice right here that the King James Bible reads, the Lord is that Spirit, very plainly. Yet if you look at the Jehovah's Witness Bible, it won't say Lord. It'll say Jehovah. <laughs> That's pretty big there. I mean, you can pull it up online right now even and then look up their New World Translation online and the last time that I checked is still read it, read it that way. Unless some Bible believer already posted it online and those JW saw that and then they changed the verse again <laughs> like they always do. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, we'll look at verse 17. Now the Lord is that Spirit and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. New World Translation, Jehovah Witness Bible will read more plainly, Jehovah is the Spirit, where the Spirit of Jehovah is, there is liberty. Very strong and powerful. Another one is Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3. Now, if the author of the book of Hebrews was Paul, he's citing here an Old Testament passage and claims that the Holy Spirit is the one speaking here. He never said God. He said the Holy Spirit is the one who's speaking. Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 7. Verse 7. <coughs> Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, Today, if ye will hear his voice, 
Harden not your hearts as in the provocation, in the day of temptation, in the wilderness. When your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works forty years, wherefore I was grieved with that generation, and said, They do always err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. It's more plain when we go to Psalm 95. Psalm 95. Now, that passage we read at Hebrews 3, remember, the author is quoting Psalm 95. Notice it's the same wording here. And remember, the author of Hebrews says that the Holy Spirit said all this, correct? Not God. Not God, the Holy Spirit. Now, go to Psalm 95. Look at verse 6. Let's see the context here, who it is. Verse 6. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. All right, in Psalm 95, verse 6, the context is Jehovah here. And capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. That's big. Because Jehovah's Witnesses, they'll insist that the capital uh, letters for Lord is definitely referring to Jehovah. Whenever you pull up Lord that does not have all capital capitalized letters, and they'll try to go around that. But this one is plainly Jehovah. Now, verse 7, for he is our God. So Je Jehovah is our God. And we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if ye will what? Here is what, that's Hebrews 3. The Holy Spirit's voice. Keep reading. Harden not your heart as in the provocation and as in the day of temptation in the wilderness when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my work. Forty years long was I grieved with this generation and said, It is a people that do err in their heart, and they have not known my ways, unto whom I swear in my wrath that they should not enter into my rest. Did that match Hebrews 3? Otherwise, I don't know what the author of Hebrews was quoting from. So there is no doubt about it. We saw in Hebrews chapter 3 and Psalm... 95, that the Holy Spirit is capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, Jehovah God. Another passage you want to turn to is Acts chapter 28. Acts chapter 28. This is Paul, and he's quoting from the Old Testament again. And guess what? He doesn't say God. He says the Holy Spirit again. He believes it was the Holy Spirit talking. What I would like to encourage Bible believers, there's got to be more verses out there, I'm very sure, is to look up New Testament passages that quote Old Testament passages, and they'll say that it's the Holy Spirit talking. They'll, remember, the formula is, thus saith the Lord. And people all know that's Jehovah God. But... It's strange, they'll say, thus saith the Holy Spirit. Thus saith the Holy Spirit. Uh, there's another case of that where Agabus the prophet said, thus saith the Holy Ghost. And you'll find that in Acts chapter 20. I believe it was chapter 20, yes. There's no doubt about it. The Holy Spirit is God. No, it's not some made-up Catholic doctrine where the Trinitarians are all a bunch of Catholics. No, it's scriptural. It's just plain as day. It's just that the Catholic Church, wicked and, let me say this without offending you, stupid of a religion it is, they were smart enough to see it compared to more stupid people who couldn't see it. <laughs> All right, then. Let's go to Acts chapter 28. Acts chapter 28. They get a, you know, let me get on the internet here, okay? They all make a big deal about and fuss about the Trinity when it shouldn't be that much of a fuss. Now, I, so I studied the theological semantics. People have always asked me, why don't you post a video on that or a study on it? Well, let me tell you why. Because it's stinking stupid. I mean, the semantics of it, the theological terminologies of it, and the ideas is just so much into bizarre and la-la land that let me give you some, uh, some eye-openers right here, okay? For some of you who don't, may not know, okay? Do you know everything in the Bible? No. 
If you don't know everything in the Bible, which you have written out for you, how are you going to understand the nature of God that's not written out for you? Everything. Ooh, ooh, light bulb flash, all right? So now I hear all this idiotic stuff about social trinity and then the gradation levels of the trinity and then Arianism and then the Nestorian view of it that's a little bit different from our typical Trinitarian view and how modern Trinitarianism is different from actually early church history of Trinitarianism. Let me give you two words, all right? The best advice you're ever going to hear. This is my doctrine. Shut up. That's why I never posted a video on that. It just goes into la-la land mode with modalism, Trinitarianism, all that kind of stuff. It's just stop. Just stop, all right? Just stop. It's so ridiculous. Let me say this. That was the problem with early church history that you'll notice. The reason why the Catholic Church monster was born and the Catholic Empire became so powerful is because they were fussing and debating about Trinity doctrines where it got into such detailed semantics that it was so ridiculous they were excommunicating everybody, cutting off from everybody who didn't agree with every fine detail about the Trinity. So then they'll say modes of the Trinity or persons of the Trinity or then, you know, you can't really say uh, three persons and one being or one essence or one substance. Just shut up, okay? Here's another no-brainer, okay? Let me give you something that might open your eyes on this, all right? What if all these semantics that you talked about, excluding like real plain heresy, okay? Modalism, Arianism, Jehovah Witness, okay? Excluding those things. But all those other semantics you are talking about, what if all those things that you are pinpointing the details and claiming they're all different might all be true? Might all be complementary? Why? Because God is omni. He can do whatever he wants to. Look, if he wants to, so I'm just going to say this. This might be an extreme statement, all right? But it's a, it is a possibility you have to consider. If he wants to be one person, he can be one person. If he wants to be three persons, he can be three persons. <laughs> I don't understand why they're making a huge deal out of this. God has three parts. No problem for him, body, soul, and spirit. He doesn't want three parts. He don't need that. Just... Shut up, okay? I mean, all of them are all... Have you ever thought about it? They all might be complementary. Oh, it's just ridiculous. All right. I had to go on a little rant because this is something about maybe six to seven years old of a huge controversy that just split a whole bunch of independent fundamental Baptists mingled in with online weirdos. Now, please don't get caught up in that and don't pull the Trinitarian semantics on me because I study them too, all right? I study them. I don't like it. All right, let's go to Acts chapter 28. Acts chapter 28. Now, when we go to verse 25, notice, and when they agreed not among themselves, they departed after that Paul had spoken one word, well spake the Holy Ghost by Isaiah the prophet unto our fathers. Again, the Holy Spirit's talking saying, Go unto this people and say, Hearing ye shall hear and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see and not perceive. For the heart of this people is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes have they closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. All right, what's he quoting from? Go to Isaiah 6. Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah is speaking here, and notice he doesn't say the Holy Spirit. He's, re he's referring to Jehovah God. Look at verse 5. Verse 5. Notice the last part reads, the Lord of hosts. Correct? Capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. So that's referring to Jehovah again. Notice in verse 12, and the Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. No doubt, Jehovah. So if Jehovah is speaking, notice in verse 
9 what he said. And he said, that's Jehovah, go and tell this people, hear ye indeed, but understand not, and see ye indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of this people fat, and make their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and convert, and be healed. Now, does that match pretty much what Paul is quoting in Acts 28? If it is, notice Jehovah speaking here, not the Holy Spirit at Isaiah 6. And when you look at Acts chapter 28, notice it's not Jehovah speaking here. It is the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? The Holy Spirit is Jehovah. It's that simple. So don't freak out about it. <laughs> and then we got Acts chapter 5. These are the five pretexts that are very strong and powerful, proving that the Holy Spirit is Jehovah. Now, we're going to look at the personality of the Holy Spirit, proving that he is a person, not just a neuter it or a force. Several things where we can see that the Holy Spirit is a person is because he possesses certain characteristics. So, We've, dis we've discovered the one, deity of the Holy Spirit. Second is personal characteristics of the Holy Spirit. Personal characteristics of the Holy Spirit. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Notice the Holy Spirit has willpower. Willpower. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And we'll look at verse 11. So the Holy Spirit, through his personalities, has willpower. So let's look at all the stuff that matches up with this blue diagram here, which would refer to his personality, his personality. First is willpower. The Bible reads right here, but all these worketh that one and the selfsame spirit. Notice dividing to every man severally as he will. So the Holy Spirit has willpower. The other one is intelligence. Intelligence. Nehemiah chapter 9. Nehemiah chapter 9. We argue for intelligent design, correct? Now, I'm pretty sure Jehovah's Witnesses believe in that one or a good number of them. If they believe in the importance of putting an intelligent agent which means a person, not a neuter it, right? Not just eternal energy, eternal gravity, like evolutionists teach, right? <coughs> if we argue or insist in this distinction for the creation of the universe, there's a distinction with intelligent agency versus eternal energy, eternal matter, etc., eternal thing, neuter it, then these are different. Intelligence then means it refers to a person. We insist that. That way we don't join the evolutionists in thinking that uh, intelligence has to equate to neuterate. Nehemiah chapter 9 and verse 20, the Bible says, Thou gavest also thy good spirit, but notice thy good spirit to instruct them. And withheld us not thy manna from their mouth, and gave us them water for their thirst. So God's Spirit taught them, teaches them. God's Spirit has intelligence to pass down knowledge and show them how to use the knowledge. That demands a personal characteristic, intelligent agency. 1 Corinthians 2, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Next one is knowledge. The next one is knowledge. There's absolutely no doubt that the Holy Spirit is God. Hands down, the Holy Spirit is God. There's no doubt about it. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and then we'll look at verses 10 through 12, 10 through 12. In reference to knowledge. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10 through 12, the Bible says, But God hath revealed them unto us by His Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man? save the spirit of man which is in him. Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. 
If we insist that the Spirit is from God, we see again deity connected here at verse 12, right? Spirit is given to us from God. That's one. Notice in verse 10, God personally references with the pronoun by His Spirit, right? And we'll see right here, it's referring to knowledge when we look at verse 11. Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. There's no doubt there's a lot of knowledge here that is attributed to the personal characteristic of the Holy Spirit. Go to Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Personal characteristic that the Holy Spirit has is power. Power. The Holy Spirit has power. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. So we've seen willpower. We've seen intelligence. We've seen knowledge. We've also discovered, or we're also going to discover that the Holy Spirit has power, and that attributes to his person. Acts chapter 1, notice what the Word of God reads at verse 8. But he shall receive power. How? After that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. So the Holy Ghost gives his power to them, de uh, demanding or showing that the Holy Ghost is a person. And he shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. We're going to look at Romans 15, verse 30, Romans chapter 15 and verse 30, the capacity for love, the capacity for love. So it's not just some energy or force. This is a person. What distinguishes neuter objects from humans? Love. The capacity to love. Now, it's getting to a scary point where they're using AI, chat, GBT, and it's becoming and developing its own intelligence. It's becoming a person, or they're trying to make it a person. But now it's coming to a point where it's interacting with the person. So now social relationship. And then it'll get to scary parts where it can turn into love. Now there's already movies on that. So it's becoming a very scary point here. What is plainly revealed from scripture, from common sense, from scientific nature itself, is that humans, persons are distinguished from objects and things. All right, that's just the laws of nature itself. I'm not even talking about scripture-wise. That's the laws of nature, but that's even shown from scripture. Mankind always wants to contradict, not just scripture, you got to realize. They want to go against the laws of nature itself. And I thought they're into empiricism. I thought they're into the laws of nature, being irre irrefutable. Apparently, they think so highly of themselves that they can override laws of nature, they think. Let's go to Romans chapter 15, and then we'll look at verse 30. Now I beseech you, brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake, and for, notice right here, the love of the Spirit, that he strive together with me in your prayers to God for me. So the Holy Spirit undoubtedly has capacity to love. So notice right here, it's not just an emotion of love, it's a capacity showing the personal capacities, personal abilities, personal characteristics, demanding the Holy Spirit to be a person. The other one is what we notice right here, the capacity, again, of grief. Capacity of grief. We're going to turn to Ephesians 4, Ephesians chapter 4. The capacity of grief. Look at verse 30, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30, a very common verse that should be memorized. It's also a great verse for eternal security. The Word of God reads, And grieve not <coughs> the Holy Spirit of God. So notice right here, you can grieve the Holy Spirit. We're going to now 
discover the emotions of the Holy Spirit. The emotions of the Holy Spirit. That's the next part. And I want you to go to Isaiah chapter 63. Isaiah chapter 63. The Holy Spirit has emotions because personally, he can be grieved himself, not just a capacity. Now, it's important to show not just the capacity of grief, but actual grief itself, because when we get to, into one day where neuter objects will develop abilities to have intelligence, develop abilities to have so-called emotions, philosophers and techno guys and scientists are all going to be debating if those emotions are genuine or artificial. That's what's going to come down into. A lot of people don't understand that. We're going to hit that nowadays. Even that uh, Satanist, Yuval Noah Harari, he mentioned here that the ones who might have a really good job in the future as the world falls into dystopia are philosophers. <laughs> You know why? Because technology is going to hit so much to a point where it's going to come across ethical issues, societal issues, and these are going to have to be debated and uh, talked about so that lawyers and government leaders can enforce the right policies concerning those things. Funny, he said that philosophers will get a good job. You know who really get into philosophy? Theologians. So I have a question right here, all right? Now, I'm not into theology or philosophy. They got their own problems. But when you study the Word of God, we do get into theological, philosophical areas. We just don't use the right semantics. I'm sorry, all right? But the Bible is filled with those matters. Why don't every minister and preacher of the Word of God get paid? <laughs> Isn't it funny? It's going to be ironic. Then it makes you wonder during the tribulation, here are the bad philosophers. They're not really philosophers. They're like what they call fake news or madhouse scientists or medical doctors who aren't really mainstream medical doctors. Aren't they already doing that right now? So they're going to be doing that with the preachers, the ministers of the Word of God one day. And philosophers who might have esteemed positions in the future tribulation, they might be known as the prophets or the real philosophers. Yuval Noah Harari is known to be a prophet to a lot of people because he uh, foretells the future from a historian perspective. So it makes you wonder about the false prophet that's going to be really recognized by everybody versus the actual prophets of God who prophesy from the word of God. They'll be called false prophets. Anyway, I'm just throwing in a whole bunch of stuff. I don't know where that came from, okay? Uh, Isaiah chapter 63 and verse 10. My, my words, okay? I know that a lot of this stuff may sound like rantings, but you're going to come across that one day online. You're going to come across that one day in the future, so mark my words. Don't forget. Don't forget what the pastor told you. It might come in handy one day. It might be something that you might go, oh man, pastor mentioned this a long time ago. Go to Isaiah chapter 63 and verse 10. The Bible says, but they, rebel, uh, th but they rebelled, and notice right here, vexed, vexed his Holy Spirit. Therefore, he was turned to be their enemy, and he fought against them. Notice that he uh, was personally grieved, personally grieved, that he turned against them. That shows that the Holy Spirit is not just energy or neuter it. Uh, he is a person. Go to Hebrews chapter 10, Hebrews chapter 10. The Holy Spirit can be insulted. The Holy Spirit can be insulted. Go to Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 29. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 29. You know what makes you a person? Okay, here's something for liberals to think about who are trying to cross the boundary lines of neuter its and people and trying to merge those two things together. Here's one thing liberals cannot deny, is that what they take pride in is humanism, correct? So human empathy is a very big thing. So much to the point that it's communist, right? That's why communism is a very attractive philosophy. 
Now, now, now today they're going to deny communism because they see the fruits of it, but what they're teaching you is basically borderline or closet communism anyway, okay? Anyways, the point is that they pride or they prioritize, they believe their worldview is human empathy. Human empathy here. If you've offended somebody, they like to call it hate speech, correct? They get personally offended. Why don't we not make a big deal out of it? No, to liberals, it is a very big deal to them because love is very important to them. Insults are very personal to them. They take that very personally. If they take it so personally, this should definitely prove that these attributes that you saw are very personal and demand the Holy Spirit to be a person. Now, you know what the problem with this liberal world is? They're afraid of offending people, but they're not afraid to offend God. They could care less that they insult him every single day. All right, you want proof? Let me give you the easiest proof, all right? Do you know how, uh, do you know how much of a crime it is where you actually say the N-word compared to maybe stealing or uh, injuring somebody? Now, that's very big, okay? Just using the N-word. Well, sh it shouldn't be a big deal, right? I mean, compared to bodily harm or bodily injury to somebody. Why is the N-word uh, so much of a higher crime to liberals? Because it's personally insulting. It has a history, too, that they'll argue that can connect to violence, that can connect to injury, that can connect to uh, a lot of horrible tragedies. I have this question. Why don't you do the same thing with God with certain words that you say? Yeah, come on. You know why? That's personally insulting to him. Well, I could care less. What's the big deal of me preaching this or saying this kind of a liberal stuff to the people and, you know, to the younger generation? Uh, you want me to teach the N-word to your younger generation? Oh, they'll, they'll call it a crime. It'll go all over the news. YouTube AI incorrectly translated it just now and will give me a strike. But thank God the internet's not working and this is all archived, all right? So we'll see what happens, all right? Uh, what's my point? My point is, is that they throw a hysteria. They make this a huge big deal about certain words that shouldn't be used because it personally insults and it has a history of so much violence or harm. That's the same thing with certain words that they're teaching their kids nowadays that's personally insulting to God that has an undeniable history of Noah's flood, for example, of the nation of Israel being turned over to Babylon, for example, of our recent generations, for example. Oh, but they use scientific journals and all this kind of liberal rationales to go around it and say, no, you can't argue cause and effect for those things. Why don't we do the same with the N-word then? Why don't we do with certain slurs against the LGBTQ plus then? I'll tell you why they refuse to do that. They want to connect cause and effect to those offensive words because it personally offends them, but they care less about God's feeling if it personally offends him. Man, I'm so glad I went to liberal universities. Now I know their rationale and I can throw it against them. This should be no doubt what I'm arguing to you is not Christian extremism. I am going by common, everyday rationales of our society here. So shouldn't Christians be now more careful of what they say or what they teach the next generations? Or to each other? Because it might be personally offensive to God? All right then. Uh, the Holy Spirit can be insulted when we go to Hebrews chapter 10. And then we'll look at verse 29. The Bible says, Of how much sore punishment, suppose he, shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified, notice, an unholy thing, and hath done what? Despite unto the Spirit of grace. You know what personally insults the Holy Spirit? The very act where you trod underfoot the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The world has rejected the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's personally insulting to him, that very act. 
Oh, that's just a harmless thing. I don't see why he'll get offended by that. How about I put the act of a Nazi swastika on my sh shoulder? I mean, I'm not doing bodily harm to people. So what's wrong with that? Oh, how can rejecting the blood of Jesus cause bodily harm to God? I don't see how it offends God and it has a personal insult and a history behind it. That he died for it. You know how many Jews died because of that swastika symbol? Personally insulting, I think. Man, I, I, use these in your witnessing tactics next time on these liberal guys. That way they can understand the serious crime of rejecting the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ in his shed blood. The very act of that. And also the kind of stuff that they teach their children. Their children. Not just to each other. Their children. If they decide to die and burn in hell, that's on them. But when they tell others, especially the younger generation and children, and damn their souls because of that, that's personally insulting and offensive to God. So use these uh, tactics, these arguments on them. I would encourage you. That way they can open their eyes more on what we teach and preach is not Christian extremism. But they are very valid concerns that we get personally insulted by. But more so, God gets insulted by. All right, uh, the other one uh, that we're going to look at is Acts chapter 5, verse 3. He can be lied to. The Holy Spirit can be lied to. So he has emotions. Acts chapter 5 and verse 3. Notice that Peter asked them, Why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? Now, the most serious one is blasphemy. Go to Matthew 12. Matthew chapter 12. Notice that the Holy Spirit can be blasphemed. Matthew chapter 12, verse 31 through 32. Chapter 12, verse 31 through 32. The word of God reads, Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh the word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, uh, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. Notice that people can blaspheme the Holy Ghost. Now, we know that Jesus is a person, Correct? If Jesus is a person, which Jehovah's Witnesses cannot deny, if you were to blaspheme Jesus Christ against his person, uh, that's something that Jesus Christ doesn't take as seriously compared to blaspheming the Holy Spirit who's supposed to be a neuter it. That don't make sense. Unless the Holy Spirit is considered to be an important person. All right, that's very serious. So... Notice right here that if you, this is another eye-opener right here. It's one thing to blaspheme against people nowadays, personally offend them, blaspheme against them, but it's a higher crime uh, when you personally blaspheme the Holy Spirit or better yet, God himself. That's something serious to think about. A lot of people don't take that seriously. All right, we're going to see other things about the Holy Spirit. We're going to see the work of the Holy Spirit now. We're going to observe the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, He can speak. Go to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. So the Holy Spirit, he can speak. We're going to also cover, uh, as we continue on, the personality of the Holy Spirit. I mentioned about the work of the Holy Spirit, but I would like to uh, mention that this section is something that uh, the Holy Spirit does what only a person can do. 
what only a person can do. So we're going to continue on the personality of the Holy Spirit, which we've covered willpower, intelligence, knowledge, power, capacity of love, capacity of grief. So we're going to continue on that topic. He searches, uh, he is able to speak. Notice Revelation chapter 2 and verse 7. It says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. All right, the other one is he can cry. He can cry out. Galatians chapter 4, verse 6. Galatians chapter 4 and verse 6. Notice that the word of God reads here. And because ye are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. All right, go to Romans 8. Romans 8. The Holy Spirit also intercedes. The Holy Spirit also intercedes. Romans chapter 8, and we will look at verse 26. The word of God reads here. The Spirit himself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. So he's able to intercede between conflicting parties. I mean, I'm going to tell you one thing. If you want one nation to get along with another nation, especially when war is coming out and tensions are high, you want to send out a person, not a neuter it. And that is what? An ambassador or what they can call an intercessor. Intercessor. So it demands the importance of the Holy Spirit being a person because the Holy Spirit is interceding in between. The other one is the Holy Spirit testifies at John chapter 15 and verse 26. John chapter 15 and verse 26. You know who you want on the witness stand? Not a dog. Not an AI. You want a person. <laughs> You want a legitimate witness, a legitimate uh, testifier. Demanding again that the Holy Spirit has to be a person. Go to John chapter uh, 15 verse 26. But when the Comforter is come, notice the latter part reads, He shall testify of me. The other one, John chapter 14. John chapter 14 and verse 26. John chapter 14. And verse 26. The other one is that the Holy Spirit teaches. The Holy Spirit teaches. Notice, but the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, he shall teach you all things. The other one is Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. The Holy Spirit leads. The Holy Spirit leads. Notice again the personal attribute attributed to the Holy Spirit for as many as are led by the Spirit of God. They are the sons of God. If we constantly say about following God's will, we are led by God, we want to make sure God controls our lives, what are we saying? The Holy Spirit here is doing that. Demanding the Holy Spirit to be God and a person once more. The other one is uh, Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16. The Holy Spirit also gives commands, showing Him to be our leader. And we have to revere, we have to honor the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God. Let's go to Acts chapter 16. And notice what the Word of God reads at verse 6. If you look at verse 6, notice they were forbidden of the Holy Spirit, right? Did you notice that, verse 6? Then you'll notice at verse 7, the Spirit suffered them not. So the Holy Spirit would not put up with it, would not allow it, showing the Holy Spirit gives command. Now go to Acts chapter 13 and verse 2. Acts chapter 13, verse 2. The Holy Spirit assigns tasks. The Holy Spirit assigns tasks. Showing that the Holy Spirit is a person. He's got management skills. If you are having trouble managing with your life, 
Good source would be the Holy Spirit, amen? If you're not managing well, then you have to check yourself, am I filled with the Holy Spirit then, right? All right, Acts chapter 13 and verse 2. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. Notice right here, the Holy Spirit assigned them a task, separated them from the task of other people, called them to do a, a different work. Roman, uh, not Romans, John chapter 15, John chapter 15. I like this one. The Holy Spirit is faithful to proceed on his mission. Proceed his mission. What is his mission that he is called to do? His mission is to show you truth. It's to show you truth and following God's will. God's will, God's truth upon your life. That's his job. He's not doing a good job if uh, you are concerned about getting deceived or being misguided. No, that's not the Holy Spirit's job is to misguide you. It's to guide you correctly. Go to John chapter 15, verse 26. But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. Now, did you notice that proceedeth from the Father? I like that. Showing that God proceeds his work of showing you truth through the Holy Spirit. So he will proceed his mission. Let that be a faithful promise for you to remember. We have to understand that the Holy Spirit, uh, his job and definite office is to be a comforter. That is his role that he is assigned to. That is his role into taking care of you. A lot of people uh, take lightly the work of the Holy Spirit when he should not be taken lightly. Let's go to John chapter 15. John chapter 15. Thank God for the Holy Spirit that the Lord Jesus Christ left behind for us. When he ascended to heaven, he knew that the Holy Spirit will be enough to take care of us. All right, go to John 14, excuse me, not 15. Go to John 14. And then look at verse 16. This is what Jesus Christ specifically prayed for. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Now that's a good memory verse. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Why? Oh, there's a lot you can talk about over there. You can talk about because Jesus Christ is coming back again. He will come for us. You can talk about the Father. The Father will meet you at the right time. He will come to you and take care of you. You can apply that to the Holy Spirit. He is already in you. He came to you and will continue to take care of things for you. Amen. So notice right here that God has constantly got your back. And it attributes to the personality of the Holy Spirit. His job is to comfort you. Uh, social media is not a good comfort. Artificial intelligence is not a good comforter to you. Chat, GPT, etc. You notice how many people are getting into that? Japan is so weird. I, I don't know if they're still doing this, but they're just weirdos online in Japan that hold wedding ceremonies with some kind of technology devices. It's just really weird. It's really messed up. What kind of a world we live in nowadays? It's a very sick world, a very distorted world. <coughs> Our comfort is not found in neuterates. Once more, I emphasize that. It's found in a person. The Holy Spirit is that person. It takes care of us. The work of the Holy Spirit has uh, much to be said. There's a lot of things that the Holy Spirit has done in your life and mine. Now, in uh, this area, there's just uh, so many works of the Holy Spirit that I cannot give to you. 
But what I would like to briefly say is if you go to Alvin Douglas' book, God Answers to Man's Questions, he has here, to my knowledge, about 40 things of the work of the Holy Spirit in relation to the Christian believer. Now, that will help you a lot as you go through, through stressful things, fearful things, a lot of troubling things, because a lot of times we feel like God is very far away from us. But you have to realize the Holy Spirit's always been inside us all that time. It's just that we haven't been yielding to the Holy Spirit, praying to God and the Holy Spirit, letting the Holy Spirit do His work in us. So I think what we need to do is finally allow the Holy Spirit to work in us, and then we can feel like God is close to us this time, not very far away. Now, there are many things here on the works of the Holy Spirit. I'm just going to give you a, a, a few, and I'm going to say it very briefly for time's sake here. But I would recommend people to look it up. Uh, what he does in relation to the believer, for one, he assures the believer of sonship and makes him son-like. That's Romans chapter 8, verse 16 through 17, and Galatians chapter 4, verse 6. So I'm not going to repeat. I'm just going to read through it once. Sorry. He seals the believer as a pledge or earnest of future glory. 2 Corinthians 1.22 Ephesians 1, 13 through 14. He fills the believer with himself, giving a victorious life. Acts chapter 1, verse 4 through 8. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. He sanctifies the believer, that's 4, sets him apart unto holiness. 2 Thessalonians 2, 13. 1 Peter 1, 2. 5. He abides continuously with the believer. John chapter 14, verse 16. 6. He takes the word of God and teaches the believer. John chapter 14, verse 26, 1 Corinthians 2, 13. 7, he brings the remembrance, the things that we have faithfully learned. John chapter 14, verse 26. 8, he testifies to us regarding the Savior. He constantly reveals Christ. John chapter 15, verse 26. 9, he guides the believer into all truth. John chapter 16, verse 13. 10, he takes our bodies and glorifies Christ in and through them. John chapter 16, verse 14. 11, he takes the things of Christ, spiritual things, and reveals them to us. John chapter 16, verse 14. 12, he gives us power to obey God in the time of weakness and strengthen us. Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 27. 13, he gives the believer power to obey the truth, irrespective of cost. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22. 14, he gives the believer freedom from the law of sin and death. Romans chapter 8, verse 2. 15, he takes the weak believer and fulfills the law of righteousness in him. Romans chapter 8, verse 3 through 4. Number 16, he gives the believer power to please God by granting victory over the flesh. Romans chapter 8. 17, he will quicken this mortal body of ours. Romans chapter 8, verse 11. 18, he gives power to mortify the deeds of the body. Romans chapter 8, verse 13. 19, he directs the believer in his prayer life to pray in the will of God. Romans chapter 8, verse 26 through 27. 19, he gives the believer victory over the terrible desires of the flesh. Galatians 5, 16 through 17. 21, he leads the believer out from under the law to liberty in Christ. Galatians chapter 5, verse 18. 22, he is the one that causes us to bear the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5, 22 through 23. 23, he gives us a holy walk as we are led by the Holy Spirit, Galatians 5, 25. 24, he assists us in putting away the things that displease our Father God, Ephesians 4, 30 through 32. 25, he puts Satan to flight by lifting up a standard against him, James chapter 4, verse 7, Isaiah chapter 59, verse 19. Let me skip down over here. 35, he inspires worship and adoration of God himself. John chapter 4, verse 23 through 24, Philippians 3, 3. 36, he comforts, Acts chapter 9, verse 31. 37, he calls men in Christ and directs them in their service, Acts chapter 8, verse 27 through 29, chapter 13, verse 2 through 4. 38, he leads in the details of the believer's life and service, Matthew chapter 4, verse 1, Romans chapter 8, verse 14, Acts chapter 10. 39, he makes genuine our access to the Father in heaven. Ephesians 2, 18. 40, he makes known our redemption rights, our possession in our possessions in Christ. 
1 Corinthians 2.12. Now that would make you want to run the aisles, shout, toss a songbook, toss up three hard book songbooks and then injure people and just yeah. praise the Lord Jesus Christ. It'll put you in a good mood for about a couple weeks, no matter how bad life goes. And that, that's good stuff, amen. I would recommend, if people can, to get that book or to get these 40 things and then put them as promises of the Holy Spirit. Not promises of God, promises of the Holy Spirit who's currently working in you. And put that in your refrigerator, put that in your door, see that first thing in the morning. Or when you feel down, to take a look at that one. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you so much for your person, the Holy Spirit. For you did not have to do things that way. But Heavenly Father, your person and who you are, your nature and the deity of the Holy Spirit is that important for our lives and thank you so much that you sent down the Holy Spirit to take care of us. Uh, without you, how would we survive, Father? Uh, bless the fellowship. Uh, bless the break time. And the next service that we're about to have, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.